Let us begin. Please join us as you are able in the responsive call to worship. Before we were born, before we took our first breath, before the week started, before we said, I love you, before we said, I'm sorry, before we figured out who we really are, before, before it all, God loved us unconditionally and fully. fully and honestly. God loved us day by day. This is where our story begins. Let us worship God. We will now hear the opening hymn. In the choir. So much choir. Welcome everyone. We're so glad you're here with us. Congratulations for waking up an hour earlier. Yeah. <laughs> We're here an hour earlier to remember who we are and why we're here. We were born of love 
and we're here to love. So I invite you to look around at all the beautiful people here this morning, waking up and let us extend a sign of peace and welcome to one another. And let us now hear the prayer of awareness, Anna. God of love, we forget the beginning of the story, that we were made from love to be love, to give love. Instead of rooting our narrative in the goodness refrain of creation, we skip ahead and find our worth at the fall with Cain and Abel lost in the wilderness. We forget that first there was you and you are love. We forget that out of that love, you created us. We forget that from the very first day, you loved first. We forget because a love like that doesn't make sense to us. Forgive our low self-esteem. Forgive our resistance to love ourselves. Forgive our hesitation to trust that even we could be made good. And forgive our tendency to, to pass that doubt on from generation to generation. Write a new beginning for us that roots our confidence in your unrelenting love. With hope we pray day by day. Amen. Amen. Beloved ones, no matter what we do, where we go, or what we tell ourselves, God created, creates, and sustains us in love. We were born of love, born for love. Love is why we're here. Day by day, we are claimed, held, forgiven, healed, and cared for. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, let us give thanks to God. Amen. And we'll now hear our music for preparation. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Here with these friends I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine. Open my ears that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest near then when the wave notes fall on my ear everything false will disappear here with these friends i wait for thee ready my god Thy will to see, open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mind that I may dare 
to ask those questions anywhere. Open my heart to know beyond doubt that I am loved. Love works things out. Open my mind. I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Amen. So our gospel reading for this morning continues with the gospel according to John, the fourth gospel written sometime between 90 and 125 AD. John's following came from a highly persecuted community who were separated from their Jewish roots. The author of John presents Jesus as co-eternal with God, one with the word from the beginning. Unlike the other gospel writers, John also organizes the sequence differently around signs. And Jesus gives long discourses where he is speaking in earthly metaphors about spiritual realities. And people are taking him literally including religious leaders who are in the dark, but don't know it. Hear this reading today from John's Gospel, chapter 3, excerpts from verses 1 through 21 from the NRSV. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see this kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and yet you do not understand these things? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So ends our reading. Let us meditate on these words in the sanctuary of our hearts and minds.
Please pray with me. Come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts, kindle us in the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit that you may renew the earth. May it be so starting within us, amen. I love the ending of the 13th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It is one of the most quoted and best loved passages in the Christian Bible. And it's often recited at weddings. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Over the years, I've done so many weddings and so many couples pick this beautiful reading as they make a leap of faith and commit themselves to love one another in marriage without fully understanding the mystery of themselves or their beloved. Progressive, non-creedal faith communities like ours often speak of hope and love, but rarely of faith. We do say some things as a denomination, the UCC claims that our faith is 2000 years old, but our theology isn't because God is still speaking. We speak of a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And if anything, that may seem inconsistent with faith. Why would I search for something I've already found? Faith is a hard word. And for some of us, it's a painful word. As the great theologian Paul Tillich conceded, faith is one of those words which often needs healing before it can be used for our own healing. Because the idea of faith has so often been used as a weapon, a stick to fend off questions, a bludgeon to punish dissent, a sharp knife to cut us off one from the other and divide the world into right and wrong and good and bad, in and out, our tribe against their tribe. It happened to me. Maybe it happened to you. So growing up every Sunday morning in my childhood, we'd all put on our best clothes, my mother and my sisters and I in dresses, my dad and brothers in their jacket and tie. We'd all climb into the car and make the short drive to St. Luke's Roman Catholic Church in Barrington, Rhode Island. And nearly every Sunday at some point, we'd hear the priest recite this in his beautiful Irish accent, quoting from the Gospel of John, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So as a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, as far as I could make it out, perish meant going to hell. Everlasting life meant heaven. So I learned from an early age that if I didn't believe what I was told, I'd go to hell. And precisely what did I have to believe? I was supposed to believe in him. Obviously, it couldn't be enough to believe that a man named Jesus existed. I had to believe that Jesus was the only begotten son of God the divine made flesh uniquely. And according to the only religious community I'd ever known, if I didn't believe Jesus was the only begotten son of God, I was toast. As I got older and my doubts in Jesus's exclusive divinity grew, 
as I met people of all different kinds of faith traditions, really good people, I felt more and more alienated from that church. How could I feel safe in a community that told me that the doubts that were swirling in my head damned my soul for eternity? How could I stay in a religion that said my salvation depended upon believing something I couldn't? It made no sense to me when I was 12. And it makes no sense to me now. Even if we accept the notion of a God who divides the human race into two groups, one sent to eternal paradise and the other to eternal torment, what kind of a God would make that division based not upon what we do with our lives, nor even what's in our hearts, but what we believe or don't believe? It seems to me like an absurd criteria for salvation. For instance, you could be Gandhi or Mother Teresa, but if you didn't believe Jesus was God or the only begotten son of God, you would be fricasseed forever. You could be Adolf Hitler or Idi Amin, accept Jesus as God and confess your sins and you're golden. It made no sense to me, and I doubt it made sense to Jesus either. Because throughout the Gospels, Jesus is greatly concerned with the quality of people's faith, but not at all with their theological beliefs. The early Christian community didn't elevate or condemn people based on their agreement or disagreement with creedal formulas. They welcomed those who walked and lived the way that Jesus walked and talked and lived. And what they offered was not doctrinal certainty, but in theologian Elaine Pagel's words, the presence of a group joined by spiritual power into an extended family. Disagreements about the divinity of Jesus persisted among his followers, among Christians, for centuries after the crucifixion until the Council of Nicaea in 325, when Constantine the emperor declared the theology. And it continued on well after that. But an increasingly rigid and fearful institutional church decreed that the fate of one soul depended upon what the intellect accepted or rejected. And in this, they were abetted by the scholars that can, were convened by King James I of England to translate the Hebrew and the Greek into the Bible of their native tongue. They took the Greek verb pisteo and rendered it to believe. And nearly every English version since has followed their lead. Pisteo can mean believe, but that's just one of its meanings. Pisteo also means to trust, to place one's confidence in. I don't think Jesus was saying, believe that I'm God or you will die. Do you think that he could have inspired the extraordinary following he gained in his lifetime with a message like that? Hi, I'm God. If you don't believe me, go to hell. I don't think that's a presentation that's likely to, like Norman Vincent Peale would say, win friends and influence people. I think Jesus, again, intended to say something like the spiritual teachers of many ages and traditions, something like, trust me, follow me on this difficult path, give it a try. I know what I'm doing. I've been where you want to go and I can show you the way, trust me. The faith Jesus demanded, I believe was really a kind of courage, the courage to risk, to hope, to strive against all odds, which is a lot like love. As a Jesuit priest, Anthony DeMello puts it, your beliefs give you a lot of security, but faith 
is insecurity. You don't know. You're ready to follow and you're open. You're wide open. You're ready to listen with a beginner's mind. Faith is different from belief. Belief lives in the head. It looks at reality and sees true or false questions. Faith, I believe, dwells in the heart as a radical tenderness, an openness to possibility, a conviction in the goodness of creation despite all evidence to the contrary. Faith knows that life is more than conditions and circumstances that change moment to moment. Faith finds the tranquil center within the storm. And when we trace the roots of language, we also uncover deeper meanings. The English word faith descends from the Latin fidere, which means to trust. And the word credo originally meant, I give my heart. And in Pali, the language of Buddhist scriptures, the word faith is sada, which means to place the heart upon. Sada also means hospitality. Sada, writes Buddhist teacher Sharon Salzberg, is the willingness to take the next step, to see the unknown as an adventure, to launch a journey. With faith, we move into the unknown, openly meeting whatever the next moment brings. Defining faith as belief and then proclaiming it as essential to salvation seems to me like a desperate projection of suppressed doubt. As the third, the great third century Bishop St. Augustine wrote, it's one of my favorite phrases from him, our faith, our questions are our faith seeking understanding. Or as the 20th century philosopher Alan Watts once wrote, belief clings, faith lets go. Authentic faith, I believe, is calm, secure, admitting of doubt, not as a threat, but as a stimulant. Real faith welcomes questions and challenges and dissent. It's comfortable with ambiguity. As theologian Dorothy Soleil has pointed out, faith without doubt isn't stronger, it's just more ideological. Whatever our faith, we must test it and challenge it. Does my faith narrow my vision? Does it fence in my thinking? Does it make me more rigid, more judgmental, more exclusive? If so, it's not faith at all, but fear hiding behind a belief system. Authentic faith faces fear as a teacher and moves on. Wayne Teasdale, a lay monk steeped in Hindu and Christian traditions wrote that faith is essentially a quality of openness, eagerness, an expectation that we see in children and other enlightened souls. It's a basic attitude of trust in the ultimate mystery behind existence. It's a gesture and a stand of pure openness. Buddhist Salzburg calls faith the animation of the heart that says, I choose life. I align myself with the potential inherent in life. I give myself over to that potential. This quality of faith, I believe, stands squarely in the best tradition of our denomination, the UCC. And I think it's time we stop being afraid of faith and reclaim it on our own terms as people of faith. As this past year, of living, this is the one year anniversary of living 
in this global pandemic. As it's taught us, none of us know what the future holds, whether it's economic recovery or global collapse, ecological healing or mass extinction, personal vitality or incurable disease, happiness or heartbreak, maybe all of them. These are uncertain and unnerving times and we will need faith in the days and weeks and months and years to come. The opposite of faith, Salzburg says, isn't doubt, but despair. And despair is a luxury that none of us can afford. We will need a faith that is at once stronger and suppler than mere belief. We'll need a faith that heals rather than wounds, a faith that forgives rather than condemns, a faith that embraces rather than excludes, a faith that opens our hearts and minds to greater possibilities. We'll need the faith of a Nelson Mandela who emerged after 27 years in prison to become the president of South Africa. His secret, keep one's head pointed to the sun, one's feet moving forward. We'll need the faith of Teresa of Avila, the 16th century Spanish Carmelite who used to pray, let nothing upset you, let nothing frighten you. Everything is changing, only God is changeless. Patience attains the goal. We'll need the faith of Oscar Wilde, the brilliant English playwright and satirist who served two years of hard labor for the crime of being gay. He said, all of us are in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. We'll need the faith of Marin County writer Anne Lamott, who said the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. If you're sure about something, then you don't need faith. It's when you have doubts that faith kicks in. Faith is a verb, not a noun. And finally, we'll need the faith of Brother Consul Mongo, the current priest and scientist who's the head of the Vatican Observatory, a scientist and a priest. And he writes, the more we learn, the more we realize, the less we know. It is this joy of ignorance that I love. And as Socrates once wrote, I'm wiser than everyone else because I know I don't know. May we live in the faith that Jesus, that God loves us beyond our knowing, beyond our understanding, beyond our doubt, beyond our fear, from death into new life, day by day. Amen. See 
safe into the haven guide. Oh, receive my soul at last. For there's a place it's as clean as a mountain stream, as bright as an April morn. There's a place for rebuilding the shattered dream. It's a place where hope is reborn. It's a place that is open to all this day, where love falls like a sweet springtime rain. It's a place that is only a step away. It's the place of beginning again. Plenteous grace with thee is found. Grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams of to all eternity. Amen. And now Tom Manley will share some announcements. Good morning, friends. It's good to see you all here today. Uh, in the before times, Pastor Lori used to remind us fairly regularly, we are not just this building. There's one thing we've learned in the pandemic, it's that she was right. But we're also more than this Zoom link. We're a community. Hey, and uh, after all, community is our middle name. And like all communities, we have events, triumphs, and heartache. And I'm going to start today with the invitations. Today, after church, uh, stick around on this Zoom to discuss uh, with Pastor Lori the sermon and the scripture. Uh, if you've got time, those conversations are usually... Uh, Fascinating. Our church council meeting. This is an open meeting. Anybody can come, uh, and they're always a delight. Uh, if you haven't come, you're you're missing out. Uh, come see what council is like, and uh, someday you might want to be on council yourself. Uh, this Friday, or no, uh, yeah, Friday, March nineteenth at noon. There is an interfaith vigil called uh, Still Not Free, Sisters Stories. Uh, it looks fascinating. There's more information in, uh, in the email mail chain. <clears throat> For Holy Week, we've got a lot going on, unsurprisingly. Uh, Good Friday, we will participate in a virtual vigil at uh, Livermore National Weapons Lab something that we used to do in person, but like most things in person, it's uh, moving online. Saturday at seven o'clock, we are holding a, a community Easter vigil concert. I think this is gonna be pretty exciting and you should check it out. Uh, we're looking at the liminal place between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And of course, 
Sunday of Easter week is Easter, uh, so show up for that. <clears throat> Uh, there are a number of things that we're collecting donations for. First, of course, is us. Uh, you can donate online uh, to help Skyline uh, Community Church continue to thrive. Uh, and you can pay uh, by writing a check or through PayPal or Quix. And there's a lot more information about how to do any of those. We also have two special fundraisers going on. The first is One Great Hour of Sharing, uh, one of four special... Uh, annual special mission offerings from the UCC. This offering supports disaster refuge UCC. The other one is uh, Youth Village. Uh, there's an effort to build an amazing community here in Oakland for homeless youth. Uh, and Sean brought this to our attention, and it looks like a terrific organization and a great cause. Uh, so look up some more information on that as well, and please uh, donate as you can. Uh, finally, uh, we are losing a beloved paid member of our community on April 2nd. Nancy Montier, the office manager, is leaving. Uh, she's been with us for years and has become uh, more critical to how Skyline runs than probably anybody understands, uh, even probably Pastor Lori. Uh, we're holding a celebration of her time with us Thursday, April 8 at seven o'clock, and that'll be online. Uh, we are still searching for a replacement for her. If you would like to be part of that search or if you have an idea of somebody who might be terrific, uh, please, more information, there's more announcements and a lot more info about all of these uh, in the weekly MailChimp. And I'm going to paste that link mm -hmm. uh, here in chat. Uh, check it out. There's so much good information there. And if you haven't already uh, on that link, you can also subscribe to, to get that delivered to your mailbox every week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. So now let us center ourselves in a time of prayer, remembering that ours is a God of love, of unconditional, constant love, a love that can only be described in metaphors like the wind, the, the sunlight, the rains, flowing, available to all, life-giving, reminding us that we are created in love, we are called good, and day by day we need to remember to be reminded of who we are and whose we are. And so may we begin again on this day. I'd like to take a moment of silence um, a year ago um, marked the start of this great global pandemic, which globally there are a hundred and mil 120 million cases. There are 2,700,000 deaths. And so let's just take a moment of silence and try to empathize with this unimaginable loss. And may part of our healing and growing awareness in this pandemic be a reminder of how much we depend on one another, that we're one planet, we're one humanity. It didn't have to be this bad. And so let us now turn our minds to this community Remembering all those we love who have died forever in our hearts. We continue to remember Ivan Quijano's cousin, Pedro and his wife, who unexpectedly were killed 
on Monday, March 3rd by a cresting river in Colombia. We continue to lift up in our prayers, Nancy Taylor and Mike Wergler on the death of their daughter-in-law, Andrea, in February. And we continue to lift up in our prayers, Tony Pegram's family at the death in early January of his beloved and only sister, Juanita. And we lift up in our prayers for healing, Tony Pegram's younger brother, Reggie, who remains hospitalized following surgery and several strokes. and has lost mobility in his hands and arms and may need to go to a nursing facility. Our prayers are with Tony and Philippia and Reggie especially, that he finds strength. We continue to lift up Susan Junfish. Um, her mother has become quite frail and has been falling I ask for your prayers for my brother, Stephen, who continues to struggle with MS and CPOD and schizophrenia and is falling more and more um, and is at risk of needing to go to a nursing home. And we continue to lift up Katie Gibbler's friend, Gabe, and Tom Manley's boss, whose husband is dying. And um, we lift up prayers of strength for Rod and Vivian, um, who is continuing with her chemo treatments. We continue to also lift up prayers for David, Al, and Claude with Claude's ongoing health challenges. Are there other prayers for healing at this time? You can type them into the chat or you can... Um, Lift up your hand, whatever's easier. Not seeing any. There's a hand. There's a hand. Okay, hold on. I have to change the gallery view. Sorry about that. Okay. There's a, oh, I forgot one other thing. Um, Charlie Holmes is moving today wow. to Walnut Creek. So we wish him well in his transition. It's a, it's a, it's a pain. It's a pain to move. Um, so, Mike, yes. I, I just wanted to correct something. My daughter-in-law's name was Julie. Oops, sorry. My daughter's name okay. is Andrea. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Andrea, okay, sorry about that. It's been about the third or fourth time we've okay. been asked that. I just wanted to okay. make sure we okay, get Okay, right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rod is trying to say something. You're muted. Let me see if I can unmute you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. So Vivian's finished with all of her treatments now. Okay. It's, it's just a matter of uh, waiting uh, another several months to okay. complete her reconstructive surgeries. Okay. And okay. Okay. Hope the waiting transition time goes well, as well as can be expected. And um, prayers for for Mike and Nancy with all the pressures that they're facing. Other prayers? Let's see if there's anybody else lifting up their hands. Becky. Becky. Yeah, prayers for good friends of mine. We just lost a very dear friend, Dee Dee Cowan. Um, Dee Dee owned a business. She was um, on the chamber board with me for a long, long time. And she is just the most beautiful soul mm -hmm. you ever met. She's a beautiful person, mm -hmm. physically, spiritually, mm -hmm. and her faith mm -hmm. and her spirit and her good nature were there until the end. She just said, you know, ladies, it's my time. It's my time. I've had a wonderful life. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. So we miss her. There's not going to be a service, but the girls will get together yeah. sooner or later. Yeah. I want to go like Dee Dee went. I want to be cheerful and say, 
thank you, God, for this wonderful life. Yeah. yeah. I doubt if I will. But. <laughs> <laughs> Are there, are there, I don't want to go. Are there, are there other prayers? Tony, do you want to, is there any more news? I think he's still muted. Hold on one second, Tony. I got, we need to unmute you. I like your sermon, Lori. Uh, well, okay. Well, well, the, the good news that in every every you know, I guess the absence of bad news is always good news. But the good news is that um, I talked to uh, well Reggie's son uh, had a sort of a call with all of Reggie's <coughs> and allowed them to all talk to him. Uh, while he was in the hospital over the speakerphone, and yeah. they said he had a good meal. He, his appetite's back. You know, he's still struggling with mobility that hasn't uh, changed. Yeah. But he he was uh, you know we were kind of talking and joking, and he just said he wanted to get out of there. So. I told him that he's made a good start by eating. And I told him pretty soon his legs are just going to start moving and, he, and they're going to take him out of there. But he's got to stay positive. Yeah. He's, he's in a very you know positive state of, uh, state of mind right now, which, which is helping. Oh, that's uh, our prayers that he that he is surrounded with that positive energy. Yeah. 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 You're a good thank brother. You. Yes. Thank you. Others? I have, oh, um, go ahead, Becky. How is Nyla Oaks doing? I noticed that Cheryl said prayers for Nyla. Yeah. Do you know how she's doing? Um, stable. She She's able to communicate less and less. So FaceTime is the best way to connect with her. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I think of her. Yeah. Yeah. And we- Hanging still, in there. Right, we still can't get in there until everybody's had COVID shots until they have and we have, yep, yep. Um, so I wanna lift up um, my um, friend from college, um, his father, Ralph Potter, who taught at Harvard Divinity School passed away. He was really special. So I lift up his pr prayers for Ralph Potter. Um, so let's turn now to gratitudes, um, prayers of gratitude. Um, I love the birth. Oh, there's Sean. It's windy season officially as the weekend. Let the wind longer days bring on the water sports. Yeah, for, um, for the spring and the signs of hope and the promise that we're coming out of COVID as a, as a, as a, as a world. Um, I love the birth of babies, so I continue to give thanks. One of my greatest joys is marrying couples and accompanying them on their journey. And then to see Amy and Justin Akuma um, and the, the birth of their second daughter, I can't wait to hug her in person. Um, and I also want to give thanks and gratitude to um, so many of you who love this faith community have been it's been a really hard year, not only with COVID, but like being church in COVID. And so I just want to thank so many of you for the different ways. It's like above and beyond with the site protection plan team, our personnel and finance teams, our search committee teams. Um, yes, um, our council members, um, our Zoom hosts. Um, it's it's a, it's, we're hanging in there, which is, which is remarkable. So these are really challenging times. Our PPP team, that's another one. Have I missed other teams? Come on. Our SLT team, our justice choir. and witness, our green team, our choir. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And I was kidding with Carolyn about what a great year it is to be moderator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Tom, for making all the announcements. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw Teresa wait, raise her hand. Oh, she, okay, let's see. Teresa, go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna go into the whole long story, but the, my gratitude is that I've begun, uh, been able to start riding my horse L again. Oh. A long time, and 
it's just wonderful because for those of you who haven't tried it, horseback riding is like more fun than anything in the world. So, <laughs> so that's been really special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're one with L. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Except when you're in a bad mood and then we're two. Yeah. Can I say something? Please do. Oh, I just want to say I'm really grateful that um, I've been able to have both my vaccinations and that um, a lot of my colleagues and school teachers are able to get their vaccinations. And I'm hoping that um, that this will allow people to start feeling safer and allow our union to make some agreements with the district that um, feels safe to everybody and appropriate mm -hmm. for the developmental needs of our children. And mm -hmm. I also hope that the parents and other people on the outside can understand that this is a scary time and, and everybody is. needs to make decisions that are mm -hmm. feel safe and comfortable for them. Yes. So, and I, but I'm feeling very hopeful. Katie, thanks for lifting that up. It's a huge, it's a huge topic. You know, parents are just dying to have their kids back in school. And then preschool parents who've been having their kids at home and then trying to do work are really desperate for more hours. And then our preschool staff is on campus, you know, during COVID. So these are these are really, really challenging times. So congratulations for getting your shots. Rod had Rod, an announcement. Rod. I've got my second vaccination on next Friday, but I want to go for Yo-Yo Magos because when he got his sec second vaccination during his waiting time before he left, he pulled out his cello and played cello music for the people who were oh. up. <laughs> uh, before Rod, because Catherine, were you raising your hand? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, one more and okay, the, Rod, he's muted. Rod, we can't hear you, you're muted. I don't know how that happened. Someone sneaked in and shut me up. Uh, as the uh, First horseman of the apocalypse is the plague. I was just wondering uh, how many people have completed their vaccination series, whether it's a single shot or two. How many haven't had any? But it's coming. It's coming. It's right, Fourth of July. Everybody yeah. uh, should, you know, is Biden's promise. So. We'll have herd immunity. It's it's hurting. It's going along pretty fast because every day I hear more and more people. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, we're getting there. Yeah. All right so. then. All right, my friends, let's join together in the. Nancy, Nancy has something to say. Oh, Nancy has something to say. Okay. Oh, Nancy, you're on mute. Um, I'm oh, there. Uh, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. That um, some of my neighbors that are 50 said that they had just gotten shots. And I think that there are some sites that are opening up that have extra shots, you know. So keep your eyes open, those of yeah. you that are under 65. I think there are places that are. Um, giving aside from those of you that are teachers and healthcare workers that um, so keep your eyes open I think even in the in Oakland this was in Oakland where um, they were able to get shots so yes thanks Nancy all right everyone let's join together in that beautiful <laughs> prayer that Jesus taught us about who we are in relationship with God and with one another our creator, mother, father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Oh, I just thought of one more th- gratitude. So Anna got a new job. She got a promotion and she's leaning into more of the kind of work she likes to do. So congratulations. We're happy for you. All right, then. Um, so please give generously, especially one great hour of sharing this year. There's all kinds of um, disaster refugee and development ministries that are being supported. And if, if not this week, there's time through Easter. So thank you. And the information about how to donate um, on the bulletin. And we will now hear our closing hymn with Gabrielle. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Oh. Beloved ones, no matter what we do, where we go, or what we tell ourselves, our doubts, our despair, our fear, God is love. God is loving us, claiming us, holding us, forgiving us, healing us, caring for us. And so let us turn to that one who reminds us that we were born of love and created to love. That's why we're here. Amen.